Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas Podcast, where attitude is everything. On today's show, you guys get a chance to, to meet one of, uh, one of the friends that I've had since I was in high school. It's incredible because him and my brother are uh, like best friends, and um, he's been such an inspiration to me. I put a, You see his name running across the ticker, Eric Chin, and this guy needs no titles. He needs nothing uh, you know, that way, but what, what I do want you to understand is the human being that he is the father that he is, the friend that he is, to every single person, even all the people who give him a hard time. And we used to give him a hard time about things that most people would dream about. Like, oh, wow, you're the smartest guy in the world. We would think that that was a challenge. Like, we would give him a hard time about it. Oh, man, you know, uh, the, the things that he was able to do, the example that he was to all of us in our small town of Lompoc, California. If you're from Lompoc and you went to Cabrillo, you, you, if you went to Lompoc High School, we don't want to talk to you. But if you went to Cabrillo High School, you know who this guy is. You know that he wore the shortest basketball shorts of all time uh, in youth basketball history and had the fastest spin move in basketball, in youth basketball history also. Um, but it's my pleasure to have this young man on the show. So welcome to the show, Mr. Eric Chen. Thanks, Kelly. It's, it's a delight to be here. I miss you guys too, you and Rob and everybody back home. So it's good to reconnect. Well, it's, it's incredible. I want to read something to you, man, because I think that it's indicative of, a, of your character when someone says something to you or about you when you're not there, right? So it's very easy to see someone and pump them up or talk about them while they're there. <clears throat> but it's different when no one's around, when you don't know they're saying it, and they say something. So I want to read something from my brother. He just, he just sent it to me. He says... Uh, I don't want to hear this. <laughs> Eric is truly remarkable. Smartest dude I've ever known. Tremendously down to earth, humble. Uh, he, he's a, he was a valid Victorian, uh, socially active, um, you know, lettered in three sports, football, basketball, tennis, great athlete. And, uh, and he wanted to know how did you manage all of that and be great in all aspects? Because most, most I mean, there's some people who are great in sports, but yeah. then they're a bonehead in the classroom. Then maybe they're good in the classroom, they're good in sports, but maybe they ain't that great of a friend. You, Eric, are one of the only people in my life that I've ever seen be a, like have integrity in all those aspects and, and perform at a high level in all of them. How are you able to do it? Well, that's nice of um, that's nice of Rob to say that. That's a really good question. I mean, I haven't really thought about it in that angle. I mean, I think I think. Um, well, it's, it's definitely, I mean, I, you know, we all have kids, right? In high school now, it's really different, right? So I'm like thinking about it in the context of my own kids and thinking, well, you know, should, you know, how do they become good at everything they do? And, um, and I think it's just, it, it's definitely different these times, but I think back then it was just about, I don't know. I think part of it is just growing up in Lompoc. It's a small community, right? There's not, it's not like growing up in these big metropolitan areas where you see, you know, like there's people that you can aspire to in the Bay Area or in LA where, that are almost unattainable, right? Like in Lompoc, everyone's kind of doing their thing, right? Like, so you're just kind of, everyone's doing everything, right? Everyone's doing, you, know, you need people to play sports just to field a team because there's there, it's just a small community. And so I never thought of it as um, me trying to, you know, do well on everything. I think it was just me trying to be a part of the community. Like, mm. you know, you just, you join a basketball team because you want to be with your friends. You join, you play football because you want to be with your friends. And then, you know, like your peers kind of um, push you to do better. So, I mean, that was a lot of it. I mean, from the, from the academic side, a lot of that goes back to my family, right? My brother and my, my parents really put that um, as a priority. But all those other things, it was just kind of me trying to fit in, right? And be part of the community, really. How did you, like with your parents, because this is, this is for all you parents out there listening, like Eric was the valedictorian and a star athlete. Um, this is not a normal thing. Um, so, but what were some of the things when you're saying it came from your family, it came from your brother, a lot of times when parents push to their kids to, you know, you've got to be uh, in academic, they end up, <laughs> you know, they end up uh, uh, doing drugs or they end up doing craziness. And I'm not saying that, uh, you know, there wasn't craziness in our lives, but you listened to your parents. What did they say that made you listen? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, some of it is obviously like when, um, when you're, 
when your parents are immigrants, you kind of feel like, you know, they sacrificed a lot to get here. So, you know, my parents came from um, China via Taiwan and they were students um, when they came over here, you know, didn't speak English very well. And so they, they obviously gave up a bunch, right? If you think about like, you know, them moving, leaving their family, coming all the way over here in a not super friendly, um, you know, society back then just to give us a chance. So there's some kind of, you feel kind of obligated, right? And then there's sort of the, the tiger mom thing where, you know, my mom is just pounding me, you know, get your, you got to get A's, that kind of thing. So it's a balance, I think, of just, there's the fear of letting your parents down. And then, and then there's, you know, frankly, like my brother played a big role. Like he was two years ahead of me. And, you know, like when you guys are siblings too, right? Like you and Rob are the same, right? Like, so you're probably always looking at Rob thinking, what he, what is he doing when you're, especially when you're young and you just want to be like him or you want to beat him at something. And so my brother was like a perfect student, right? And he went to, um, he got an electrical engineering degree from Berkeley. So like his, just him doing really well, just pushed me as well on the academic side. Sure. So, so how do you, I mean, most of the time too, you don't find people who have the academia side, right. And, and, and have the interpersonal side the way that you do. I mean, you connect with people in the friendships and the, I mean, even your friendship with my brother, I think I, I, it could be a movie, like it could be <laughs> a movie. It could be a reality series, like the two of you going back and forth and, you know, he, he would always give you a hard time. But he had the utmost respect, you know, utmost respect, and you, and you really inspired him. But we're we're in this time right now where you know you're up in the Bay Area, where obviously there's a mix of academia, but then there's also the entrepreneur side, right? Their entrepreneurial side, where um, you know I didn't go to college, and my brother went to college. My brother went to law school. You went to Stanford. Your kids, like, as I'm going, my kids, because I come from where I do as far as me making the path that I did, I'm, I'm looking at it as a, you know, they can do college, they cannot. You didn't really have an option, right? Not to, say right. The, not to say you were forced, but you didn't have an option. Can you talk to us, too, about the world that we live in where some people are not taking the traditional routes, and how do you feel about it? Um, what is your take on it? And, and, you know, how, how do you, how did you, uh, uh, connect that with your children and, and the generations to come? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think for me, like my path was very traditional and I mean, it, you can look back and say, well, you know, if you're a kid and you want to do well in life, you go, you study really hard, you go to a good school, you get a job on wall street and then you go back to business school. And that's kind of what I did. I mean, it wasn't, um, it was just the path that I took. And then, but then I realize, like, as you get older, you kind of realize, well, the people that are really doing interest, and it took me about 10 years into my career to figure this out, right? You, you kind of realize, well, none of that stuff really matters. It's like everyone is sort of kind of like you, right? I mean, everyone is sort of meant to do something like that they're destined to do. And I, I kind of think about it as like, you know, you really have to find what it is that you're supposed to be doing. And I, hopefully that's something that you're good at. And hopefully it's something you enjoy doing. And if you have that overlap, it's like you, right? I mean, you, you look like you love what you're doing. <laughs> Rob looks like he loves what he's doing. And so I just think like that was kind of the search. And a lot of that, frankly, is not um, about the academics, right? Like as you get older, you start to realize that all those other things, like the relationships with people, how you're dealing with people, the social component of that's so, that's way more important than getting good grades. I mean, there's kind of like, like you kind of have to have a baseline of, yeah. Like, yeah, you got, you know, you got to know certain things, but once you hit that sort of, you know, bozo threshold, then it's all those other things, man, the interpersonal stuff. And I got like, when I was growing up, I learned all of that stuff, not from my parents, right? Cause you know, culturally they were different. They were from another country. Um, I learned it from my peers, from you guys, right? It was just like, you learn that stuff by hanging out with your friends. And I think we were blessed, right? I was blessed to have friends like you and Rob and then the rest of our cohort of people who are so different, but you kind of like, that kind of prepared me to, you know, deal with other people of all types. So it's all those people things, man. When did, when did you start to realize that? Because you did, I mean, you, you, you did so well in, in, in school, right? I mean, and you know, you're going to be humble about it and be like, yeah, you know, I worked, but no, I mean, you were literally, I mean, Rob said you're the smartest guy that he knows the same way with me in my life. You're the, you're the most intelligent guy that I've ever met in my life. Um, 
So you go right from high school, you go into Stanford, then you go to Wall Street. And I remember thinking like, oh man, Wall Street. But then I remember hearing, and I don't know that this is exactly correct. So correct me if I'm wrong. But it was like you went and you slept, you, you were in an apartment with multiple people. Um, and it wasn't like you just, you know, went to Wall Street and then bang, you were the wolf of Wall Street. You were <laughs> like, you were putting in work, you were sleeping. I mean, how many people lived in the apartment? I remember hearing that there was more than three. No, there are, th there are three people that are supposed to be there. <laughs> there are three people in a one bedroom, um, like studio in on 44th Street, East 44th Street. So you middle. said supposed to be. So how many people were up in that joint then? Yeah, I mean, at one point there were four people living there. So in a, I mean, in a, was, in a studio, was, yeah, it was living in squalor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at that time, like, you know, Wall Street was, and I mean, I don't know if I would, I, I definitely learned a bunch of lessons working those hours, but it was a grind. I mean, I, I probably spent, there were days where I would spend literally 140 hours at work, you know, just a week and not like for the first six months of working there, I didn't leave the island of Manhattan. Right. So it was just, it was a different, um, and I don't know if that's a great use of, uh, <laughs> I don't know if a recent, a new grad, I would ever advise someone to do that. Uh -huh. Look, I mean, I think, um, I have memories from the, I mean, it was, it was crazy. So, yeah, I mean, I, I have stories about wall street and stuff, but I realized it wasn't for me. You know, how quickly into it did you realize that it wasn't for you and how did you not get wrapped up in wall street? Because people took, can lose uh, themselves, right, Eric? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I guess I can tell you a quick. I can, <laughs> I can tell you a quick story about um, Wall Street, if that's okay. Of course. Uh, it's, I have to do. I mean, it's going to sound crazy, but it is true. Um, so one of my first assignments on Wall Street, um, we were, you know, and we were an investment banking firm called Solomon Brothers, and one of our clients was. Um, was Trump hotels and casinos. So we were advising those guys. And one of the things that we had to do was we had to come up with a, um, a valuation on one of his uh, properties. And he was trying to sell a privately held entity and, and merge it with his publicly traded entity. And, um, you know, he went around and asked, basically asked for an investment bank who would give him the highest valuation, right? And so, so, you know, our guys raised their hands and said, we'll do it. So my first job was to basically work backwards like a chemistry problem and find a way to justify the highest valuation for one of his properties. And, um, and I was like, this is kind of nonsense, right? This is like working backwards, right? This is not what I learned about finance. And so it was just one of those eye-opening things where, you know, like the Wall Street is sort of backwards, right? Like you're, you're just there to, you know, put a certificate on something. So it wasn't, it didn't feel like meaningful work for me. Uh -huh. um, and then I, I will tell you another story. I did, uh, we, we ended up um, going on a road show with Donald Trump. So I did end up flying around the country with that guy on his plane uh, for a couple of weeks where he had to go and pitch this merger to a bunch of investors. Uh, I'll tell you one funny story was for the longest time, and, and the guy's like really uh, charismatic. So I can understand, you know, he's a super personal dude. Um, but for the longest time, he would call me David. Right. <laughs> like and every time, I'll tell you why. Every time he called me David, like my other guys would just like chuckle, like, you know, it'd be funny, right? And then finally we figured out why he was calling me David. Because three months before he was also on a roadshow to raise high yield debt. And the little Asian analyst that was working for another investment bank, his name was David Wong. So he's like every Asian analyst, his name <laughs> It's the funniest thing. But anyway, that's my, that's my Donald Trump story. That so, so Eric, can you talk to us about environment? Because like, you know, for me, I remember, uh, you know, now I've started to read. Now, when, when you and I met and through my whole high school career, I'm very proud to say that I read one book and it was Island of the Blue Dolphins, the whole, my whole <laughs> educational career. And this is the reason why. Catalina, that's the one about yeah, the cat. the one about Catalina. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the reason why I didn't follow you to Stanford is be, because of that's probably one of the facts is uh, or one of the, uh, the the deciding factors is I only read one book in my whole entire educational career. But since then, I started to read and 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 a lot about the Bay Area and a lot about the 
uh, tech, uh, you know, the, the uh, technology um, industry, things like that. And I remember thinking, like, I wish that I would have taken the time and got up into the Bay Area because it's almost like being in the environment, you started to, it, it became second nature. Does that make sense? And so the, the types of things, say, like Lompoc, our environment, it breeded friendships that lasted a lifetime. Like I was just with Will um, this weekend. Yeah. I was just with Alfred. We Every year we come together and we ride bicycles um, and we go back to being nine years old. We do it for my birthday every year. Can, yeah. can, you, can you talk to the fact or, or help me to understand like what impact does environment have and how, yeah. can, how, how whether positive or negative that it can have on a person? Yeah, I think it's everything, man. Like it, um, both for, like you said, for good and for bad. Um, you know that saying where they say like you're the average of your five closest friends. Mm -hmm. That's kind of true. Like I mean, like that's why, like I think in the Bay Area, at least everyone is um, like people have very ambitious goals, and you get, I mean, for for better or for worse, you get caught up in that. I mean, my kids are kind of caught up in that now because the Bay Area school system is, is, you know, you know, is quite intense. So I think. Um, you know, for me, at least I think in, in the startup world, it is sort of tournament theory, right? Like you're trying, you're competing with thousands of other startups and the odds are against you. And everyone's trying to recruit the same people. Everyone's trying to get the same customers. Everyone's trying to, you know, be that next unicorn. And it's, it's kind of this weird thing where everyone sort of brainwashes each other into thinking they can do crazy things, like really ambitious things, like, you know, Elon Musk type things. And it kind of happens, right? A few of them break through, um, but we don't. We, I mean, but you don't see the darker side of it, which is there's a lot of failures. I mean, the the average startup, the average project doesn't make it. And so I think, for me at least, um, just with my community, like we're we're all striving to because I, you know, I'm a I invest into startups at a really early stage for my business. And, you know, we're, I'm competing with a bunch of guys that are, you know, they have different angles. They're all super smart PhDs. Um, and you just, you know, you get caught up in that and it can be somewhat dangerous. If you don't pay attention to the things that are important. How have you been able to stay so grounded as you've gone along? Because even, I mean, I think about it, right. And so there's, there's different markers in life, right. And now, now Rob and I's marker was a little bit different. It was like, wow, you got like a two bedroom apartment, like you are rich. You know what I'm saying? Like when we grew up in Lompoc, like, you know, we were on uh, North B Street with a one bedroom apartment, five people. I mean, it was like Wall Street for you, right? <laughs> and, and I remember we had those markers and I remember one marker that you had and it was a red IROC. It was a red, a, red, or a red Camaro. I remember seeing that bad boy. I was like, man. And I was like, in my head, I was like, I wouldn't be humble if I had that bad boy. It was a five speed. I remember I got to drive it a couple of times because uh, you guys, you know, needed <laughs> me to drive before I had a license and you let it happen. So if your kids are listening to this, dad, dad was the man, but uh, Uncle Kelly was driving you home. Um, that was, it was because I was tired. I was <laughs> very drowsy, very drowsy. Um, but Eric, how, how do you like when, when those markers hit, right? Even at that early age, you had the, the, the red Camaro or you got, you know, you, you got to drive that bad boy. I would have lost my mind. And I think God knows that. So he didn't allow me to have that at that time. How were you able to stay so grounded, so rooted? And as you've gone along with the other markers that you have, like how, I mean, how does that, what do you do? What, what's your bumpers and what's your anchors? Yeah, I mean, I've grown uh, and evolved. For sure. So I think the answer back then was way different than it is today. Like back then, I think I was still very much focused on um, getting good grades, right? And not getting into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, a lot, my parents obviously had a lot to do with that, right? So I think, you know, just trying to, um, trying to keep pushing and, you know, based on the sacrifice they made and, yeah. you know, I, I like I had an obligation to, to try and get into a good school and do well and that kind of thing. So that's kind of what kept me going back then. Um, and I think for, but it, it's different now. Like I think, you know, just like you probably have gone through your journey about finding what's important to you. Like it's taken me a long time to realize that like what really matters, um, and especially in Silicon Valley where you see a lot of, you know, 
explosion of wealth that happens seemingly overnight. And you really have to pay attention to kind of what's important. So for me, like a lot of um, my success was, was fortunately grounded um, in kind of my kids, right? Like, like when you have kids, like I don't care, right? Like they just want you to be around. <laughs> and so like, I think that like, the, so my family for sure, Laura, Nate, Sophie are sort of what have grounded me um, for the most part in what is really important. And then, you know, I, I, th as I've gotten even older, like as my kids get older, I think part of what I start thinking about is, I mean, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but you kind of have to take care of yourself, right? Like you have to get, um, you don't want to be a burden on your family. You want to have the right relationship with your family. So I've spent a lot of time recently just trying to make sure I'm healthy from a physical, mental, emotional perspective, right? So mm -hmm. I take time for myself. I, you know, I take, you know, I'll, I'll spend time, I'll go surfing, you know, I'll make sure I'm um, in shape, those types of things. And it's important because um, I don't want to burden my kids or, and have a, you know, a bad relationship with my wife and those things you got to work on, you know, like, so I think, I think um, as I've gotten older, it's been even more like looking at myself as in, well, I really got to take care of myself to be able to take care of other people, help, you know, I have the right relationships with my kids and, and just the work stuff too. Does that make sense? I'm kind yeah, of rambling. Absolutely. No, you're not rambling at all. Do you still, I mean, do you still sometimes like, cause obviously you, you, you stay in shape, you're working out. Do you still have the, the uniform from the uh, Vandenberg uh, basketball league? Uh, and do you wear it occasionally when you work out? <laughs> my, my, <laughs> my shorts. <laughs> <laughs> they were just some John Stockton's that you had. They were, uh, for those of you out there listening, if you know who John Stockton was. Yeah, no, you gotta try to stretch those things. <laughs> <laughs> so, Eric, what drives you now? Like, you know, I mean, we all get to these uh, these these places, right? And I, I think about like when you were talking about Wall Street, right? And you know, it was just it's just what you did. It was in your DNA. You just go and do it, and it wasn't like you had to think about putting in 140 hours. You just did it. It's because what you did, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think like at that time you, you go through different phases at that time, I was just heads down grinding, right? Like there was a, when I was, when I didn't know anything, when you grind, when you're young, like you don't know anything. So like for me, it was just sort of, I can outrun people, right? I can out um, hustle people. And it was just really, you just work harder than everybody else. And that's not the right way to do it. Like I wouldn't give my 22 year old self that kind of advice, right? I would tell you gotta, I would tell him to step back and, you know, reflect on what really is important. Right. And, and so, but back then I didn't know any better. So you just kind of work as hard as you can. And then you try and put yourself in positions where there are opportunities to get lucky. So that's kind of, what I, I mean, that was it. But now reflecting back on that, I do really focus on, um, it's kind of a lot of what you talk about in your podcast. It's like, you know, you got to focus on what it is that you do well, uh, your passion and, you know, hopefully those things overlap, right. They can, cause you want to do what you are meant to be doing. And now I'm at a position where, yeah, it's kind of like, what is it? It's the, it's the hell yes test, right? It's not a hell yes, it's a no. So like I've only focused on things that um, is really a hell yes. And if it's not obviously something that I enjoy doing or I'm excited about that I feel it internally, I'm just not going to do it. So, and I have the luxury of doing that for sure, right? It's a, you know, it's a privileged position. I'm aware of that. Um, but I think it just, for the stuff that I'm trying to do, like working with the right people and not putting up with stuff, you know, like not putting up with um, people that might not look at the world the same way is important to me now. If you were to look back, because now, um, you know, I think about it, you, you've slowed it down, right? When you were talking about the grinding part and it's like, when you're grinding, you're just, you're just like, I don't even care if I'm making any progress. I'm just moving, I'm going. Yeah. And then you get to this mastery part, which I believe you've always been at a mastery part in my head, at least maybe you don't think that you were, but you're now at this mastery piece where you've slowed down and things start to come to you and you're, you're the, the hell yes test. I love that. What you just said, what, like, what seems so easy that was tough back then for you to understand what seems so simple now when you look at it and you're like, if I would have just shifted that, I would have got exponential results. Whereas when you were in it at 22, then you're just like, Arr! right. Yeah. I think part of it is just the filter, right? Like you have this filter and there's all this noise coming at you all the time, especially when you're young and you don't, you can't filter out the noise. Like you're, you're trying to look for, you know, 
signal to noise ratio, right? You're trying to look for signals. So you want to look for things that really matter. And I think when you're young or it takes a while, it took me forever to try and filter out all the nonsense, you know, like what other people think or, um, you know, that mattered to me a lot. It still matters to me, but like it matters less, you know, or, you know, all the other opportunities coming at you to really focus on what you think is important. So that to me is probably the biggest thing, you know, and learning how to be to, you know, re really learning just to focus on doing a couple of things really, really well and ignoring everything else. You know what I mean? Like before it was kind of like you try and do five things and you kind of do them lukewarm and that's not nearly as good as just doing one thing. I kind of, kind um, you know, I, there was a, uh, an executive coach that I used, his name's Matt, who was really helpful in helping me, um, just kind of focus in on what's truly important or not and try and get, get to what, you know, people call it flow state or people call it being in the zone. So like a lot of athletes get into the zone. Like I don't think I've ever been in the zone in basketball or anything like that. Right. But like, um, like people find the zone sometimes they get into this flow state. And I think, uh, you can do that for work too, right? Like you can do that for all kinds of different parts of your life is to try and find, uh, an ability to get into the zone and you, where, you know, like things are just kind of, um, happening to you, like through you, you know what I mean? Like, and you're affecting the world in the way you want it to be. And it's just, it's in sync. So I'm trying to get to that level. How do you access that? Like, as far as, I mean, and I'm just talking about you personally, how does Eric enter flow? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's hard, right? I think, um, a lot of it is habits. You have to practice it, I think. So there's no, you know, I don't believe in like long-term goal setting per se, right? I really do believe in, um, like you gotta do it repeatedly because, you know, it's like every, you gotta, um, practice getting into the zone. It's like, it's just, you know, practice, right? So you gotta, you gotta wake up you gotta think about what you have to do that day. And then you gotta set aside time. And then before you, you know, like enter into some deep work, you have to try and ignore everything else. Right. So I think a lot of it is, it's nuts and bolts stuff. You have to practice it, you know, like, um, atomic habits, that book that I, you may have read, right. Um, it's about kind of doing things, um, easy and building on it, stacking it. And like, I do all those things now, right? Like I never did that when I was young. Right? <laughs> you kind of just wait it when you're young, but when you get older, you don't have as much time and you're not as, you don't have as much energy as younger folks. So you have to be smarter. So help me to understand too, because we were just having this discussion in our men's group this week where there's times where every person who flies in a in 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 the realms uh, that you do, um, when I get a chance to talk to them, then they do have atomic habits, they do have rituals, they do have those things. And mm -hmm. as we were talking about it with with our men's group, I was saying, how do you st uh, how do you prevent those routines from being a religion? Because there's sometimes people get so focused on their routine, right? Mm -hmm. That yeah. then, then there's no space for the magic. And you right. talked about it earlier and you talked about luck. We're going to talk about that too. But yeah. you seem to have these rituals in your life. You seem to have these things, but you also leave room for the, the lucky, lucky part. How are you able to do that and make sure that you separate it as you go? So you know what? The, so for me, the secret is actually saying no to a lot of things. Because I have to give myself enough space um, for just reading a random book, for example, that has nothing to do with um, what I'm working on, but it's just serendipity because of the business that I'm in, right? So I'm in venture capital and I have to, so we have to know a lot of, we have to know a little bit about a lot of things. So I have to be, um, I have to consume a lot of information at a very thin um, layer, right? And so for me, that means I have to just have time to think and to reflect. And it's actually, and so for me, I, I you know, I, I, have these rituals that I do in the morning and those types of things. I try and stick to them as much as I can. So I do have like a streak going and, you know, like there's some things I don't miss out on, but for me, the secret is actually giving yourself enough space during the day to just sit and relax and not feel rushed. Um, now, sometimes I think like, you know, especially um, in your business, right? Like it's, it's hard, right? Cause you have, you have scheduled meetings and interviews and stuff you have to do. And those are the things that I'm very careful about. It's kind of like, you know, do I really want, you know, I have to think really hard. It's come back to this hell yes thing, right? Do I really want to spend 30 minutes on that phone call? Wow. 
right? You really have to think through that versus, cause it's very disruptive, right? Like you want to get protect, you want to protect your times. Cause sometimes, you know, you, you need a three hour chunk of time um, to really focus on something. So if you schedule, you know, a 15 minute catch up call with someone, that's like 15 minutes before and 30 minutes after that's just ruined your flow, right? So I try and really block off my time to have deep time to think about stuff or to read or to dig in. So when you're, I mean, you're, you've always been a very regimented guy and not, uh, not rigid, uh, don't get me wrong, but regimented. How does that work in a relationship and in a marriage? Because I'm a systems guy. I always have been, right? Or at least I developed into one. And then I got married. And I tried those systems in my in my marriage, and uh, my wife was like, "You need to back back up, because I ain't, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not a procedure in your business. I'm sitting across from you, and I'm a woman, and I need some time. How have yeah. you been able to when you when you when you're as high functioning as you are? How are you? I mean, does it relate, Eric? And uh, have you found the holy grail on how to have that marriage? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you got to work it. I think you just have to work at it. I mean, I think. It would be, yeah, that's funny. Like, I don't, I don't, yeah, I can't, I don't think Laura would want to be a procedure either. (laughs) (laughs) I thought she was going to be happy, Eric. I I was like, look, I got this thing down. You know, I even numbered when I would touch her leg. That was like a number one. And then a number two was her, you know, shoulder. And then number three was like, you know, uh, rubbing her hand. But I would never go from one to two to three because I wouldn't want her to catch onto my Oh, right. And so I yeah. just mix them up a little bit. And she was like, are you kidding me right now? Like, I know you're trying to systemize it. Um, you know, yeah, so not, not very romantic at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how do you switch then? Because when you're going into like in, in venture capital, you're having to assess a person walking in the room, right? So you're having to assess body language from that person, the, the, the vocabulary that they're utilizing, they're intelligent. You're having, to, you're having to make sure that that happens. How do you go from that to then just being present with your wife and helping her to understand that you love her at the level you do? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you, you form kind of boundaries in your work, right? So, I mean, it's kind of a work uh, brain and you have a, a relationship brain. But, I mean, the, the reality is you have to work. I mean, I, for me, I have to work at it for sure. Um, you can't just let it sit. Um, Cause you know, like people, you have to work on your, your marriage. just like everything else. And you have to cut, you have to carve out time. Um, I could be better at it for sure. Yeah. But I mean, look, I think like Laura has been super, um, supportive of what I do and, you know, and it, it's, uh, cause my, you know, in our business, it is fairly like you have to be on call a lot. Right. So, um, it's helpful to have a very supportive wife for sure. How, what have your kids taught you? Because I would think, and every person that knows you would think, wow, it'd be so awesome to have uh, Eric as a dad because you're the wise, you've been wise since you were 14 years old. But most of the time, I find that we get schooled by our kids. So what have they taught you? And, and tell us about something specific in the last little bit, uh, you know, that, that, your, that your kids have helped you to understand. No, oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean... I think both of my kids are very different from me, right? So I think like the biggest thing is that there's different ways to, um, you know, they taught me that there's different ways to excel. Like, cause you know, my son does things way different than I did, right? Like way different than my wife does. And there, he's completely, um, thinks about things his own way. And I think, and he, and he does really well in school, but it, he does it his own way. Right? Like, so if he has to crank at the very last minute, stay up all night, uh, he'll figure it out. And I'm really proud of him for doing that and kind of doing it his way. And so like, I think just, you know, just realizing that, you know, you, you don't have to do it. Like you don't have to be a tiger mom or lion dad about, you know, pushing your kids to do stuff. They kind of figure it out themselves. That's probably been the best. I mean, they just started driving and stuff and it's been a little scary and, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, you, you, your kids have to learn just like we did, right? Growing up in Lompoc, you just, you learn by just, doing stuff like driving around to see <laughs> going to play people's places. It's just some of those things. He's got to go through that same experience. So you talked about uh, quite a bit. You alluded to it uh, earlier about what, what truly matters, right? And mm-hmm. you, you've used that, you've used that phrase a couple of times. What truly matters to Eric? Yeah. I mean, so my friends and my friends, family, I think are, more important to me now, I think, as I, you know, because one of the regrets I have, I think, is when I was growing up and um, even 
as I, in the first few years of my career, I didn't take those relationships as important. Like those, like looking back, those things are the most important things you could get. Like the most important thing out of going to a school like Stanford was the relationships that I made. And I could have nurtured those and maintained those and paid more attention to those things, like way more than I did. Um, and now I'm learning that lesson, you know, like 25 years later. And so I do try and put an emphasis, especially with my kids and my friends now, and even reconnecting with people um, like that, that plays a big role for me. Um, so that's on the, and I think, you know, I think like, you know, I talked about Laura a lot and the kids, I think they play a very big part of what I do and why I do it. So I think that's probably, yeah. well, Eric, I think we all go through those um, kind of epiphany moments. Um, sometimes they're not as large. Sometimes it's, you know, what, what triggered this part for you to realize that I need to focus on what mattered? Well, I don't know. I mean, like my, my, some of it is just where am I finding joy, you know, doing what I do. And I, I do enjoy my work for sure. Right? Like I, I'm in a, this really privileged position of being able to work with really smart people. And I get, I learn a ton from, um, you know, the portfolio companies and founders that I work with for sure. Cause they're all geniuses and they all teach me new things all the time. Um, and so like, to me, it is realizing that it's really about the relationship with people. Mm. And there's like this blurring of work and, um, home and family that ideally you would try and get to. So now, even now, like I try and involve, uh, my family in some of my work. I mean, they, they think what I do is just, you know, goofy, right? So they don't, they don't care at all, right? <laughs> but for the most part, I'm still trying to get them involved somehow and trying to connect that because work and life are kind of the same. I mean, ideally, right, your work is, doesn't feel like work. It's just part of life. And so I'm trying to get to that point. And I think it, it, it does mean at the end of the day, like focusing on the relationships, not just with my family and friends, but also with, you know, the founders that I work with and uh, the investors that I have and the advisors that I work with. So Eric, you know, for me, I, I, my dad always was with me, my pop, right? And you remember my pop. Um, he would always want me to keep things as simple as possible. So just be, I think he did that for me because he knew where my mind was. Like I learned like a four-year-old. If you were to explain venture capital to a four-year-old, how would you do it? Um. So you basically are looking for a group of high potential entrepreneurs that you want to support and you're going to give each of them some money. All, almost all of them are going to fail and the one, one of them will turn into Elon Musk. That's the business, right? So, <laughs> so you think about that, for you're... those for those listening, Eric, what is the when when we talk about percentages, right? So, uh, Chef Charity, I was just I just had her on the show, and she was talking about stats. What is the percentage that is going to work out when you're dealing in venture capital and you're dealing in the startup world? Yeah, I mean the the numbers are not pretty. Like if you just look at the overall, there's probably tens of thousands of startups every year that get some sort of funding and mo most of them will fail. I'd probably say, um, 95% of them will fail. So one out of 20 will make it. Um, and then of that, maybe one out of 10 of those, tw uh, of that one out of 20 will become what we call like a billion dollar company, which drives most of the returns in our business. And so, um, it is a very skewed business towards, you know, it's a power law business for sure. And we're all our whole job in life really is to find the one company. And you know, it's probably about 50 to a hundred companies every year that turn into very big companies. And that's out of tens of thousands. And we're every year we try and find one of those companies and that will make or break our business. But you know, there's a lot of, you use the term grace, but there is a lot of grace in what we're supposed to be doing. Because like, if you think about it, um, you work a lot of venture capital is about failure and how to deal with failure and turning the failure into learning. Um, not just us, but sp especially for the founders and there are people, their friends that you care about over time. And I think, um, you know, a lot of our business isn't pleasant because we end up saying no a lot. Right. And so 
that's not always your kind of, you're kind of crushing someone's uh, dreams. You know, you're kind of saying your baby's ugly, right? Nobody wants to be told their baby's ugly. And I think there's a way to do that with grace and to try and um, help however you can. I don't want to say like to teach or anything like that, because I'm not like, these guys are all smarter, right? Um, but if, if there's a team that, um, you know, ran into some bad luck in the market, you kind of want to be there for them because he or she is going to be back again. They're going to try again. And, you know, like we've backed a lot of founders for their second, third startups where their first ones haven't worked out as well. I haven't had, haven't turned it. And I think that's kind of the, that's the business, right? Like, you know, you don't, um, what's the Nelson Mandela quote, right? Like I never, I never lose. I either I win or I learn and it's kind of the same. Yeah. So who, who gave you permission in that realm? Because when, let's go back. I mean, when you're, when you're raised in a family that the expectation is, is, you know, pretty high. Plus you're also from an immigrant family, you're looking at it saying like, if my parents sacrificed all these things, then I've got to go, I've got to go hard. Right. And it creates that. But who gave you the permission to, to fail? Because those are going to be the greatest lessons. And I could tell you from, from my standpoint, watching you, Growing up at the early age that we were, it was like you had this superpower where you allowed yourself to, like, you were going at it, and if it didn't work out, you were cool, and it didn't affect you as much. Who gave you that permission? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I I think part of it was that that's the advantage of growing up in a place like Lompoc, right? Because it it felt contained that there was a certain amount of safety involved. I mean, maybe I'm looking back and maybe I'm reflecting a little bit too much. And I probably didn't feel that way back then because that's all we knew growing up. It's like this universe of people around us, right? Like Santa Maria was like way out there, right? That's like 30 minutes away. <laughs> so like, I think Lompoc was just contained. And I think there was an element in retrospect, there was an element of safety there where you can screw around and, you know, I mean, not so much the school stuff, but like socially, right? You take a lot of risks when you're in high school. And it felt like, at least with um, the group of people that I grew up, you know, a lot of our friends that even though like, you know, everybody gave everybody a hard time for sure. I mean, people were brutal, right? <laughs> Just <laughs> people were rough. Um, it always felt like you weren't going to get kicked out of the tribe, right? Nobody ever felt like, um, and I think I'm blessed because I grew up with that group of people. And so that support system was there for sure. I think the, like the biggest risk for me growing up never felt wasn't, it was never the academic side of things. It was always the social side of things, right? It was never, um, it was never sort of, you know, it was always like trying to fit in, um, and those types of things versus the academic side. Yeah. Well, so, and also too, like when you, when people have talked about this in the past, when I've heard the, you know, the sum of the five people, right. You talked about that earlier and then they talk about cutting people out of your life, right. You know, Hey, if this person is doing this, you got to cut them out and you got to do all that stuff. Well, if that was the fact, you would have had to cut us all out, Eric. Um, and, but it's amazing because you had so much grace. Like you had so much grace because really, if that, if those, if that advice was true, and this is something that for me, when I, when I hear that part, you got to cut everyone out and only the people that are exactly in line with your mentality, I find that people lose out on some relationships and experiences. How did you have that wisdom at such a young age? Because honestly, like if you would have listened to that type of advice, you wouldn't have been our friend. Like you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have stayed in our realm because the, the, I mean, not only in the academic side that you flew in, but also too, I mean, just as, as the person, you know, how, how were you able to do that, man? Yeah. I I mean, I think, I do think like, you know, the, there is a little bit of struggle, right? Like you, you, you know, everybody in our friend group was very different. <laughs> so like it wasn't, a, it wasn't homogenous in any sense. There wasn't like a, you know, a, um, a formula for being cool. Uh, it just felt like everybody was very different. Right. And so I think, um, I don't know. I, th- I mean, part of it comes back to like what I said about your, your dad earlier before the show was like, you know, I remember, you know, he was, we make one of them and he would just laugh at himself. So I think a lot of this is just about learning to not take things so seriously, which I, you know, I remember distinctly that moment with your dad where you kind of, I was like, wow, that kind of flipped the way I thought about things, which was, you know, your dad was very comfortable laughing at himself. 
just not taking it super serious. And that was kind of, that was like a, a, you know, a different, a new moment for me where I was like, yeah, these guys are making fun of me all the time. Right. Um, but I, you know, like I'm not taking that stuff too seriously. Right. Like, and no one's kicking me out of the tribe. So it's just all fun. Right. So I think, you know, I just look back and I was like, that part of my life was super, I was super blessed. So I don't know. I think, um, you know, I think everybody has, um, you know, their unique skill set, right? Like I look at, um, I, I remember when you were growing up, you, I always knew you were going to do something different because you never thought like everybody else, like you could tell, I mean, I, like a, probably, you know, by the time you were in middle school or something, everybody knew you were different <laughs> in a good way, in a good way. So we all knew you were going to do something different. Um, you weren't going to go down the, the path, but we all knew you were going to do something different and it was going to be really awesome. How, how ha, ha, can it be, um, you know, when you, when you, again, you have both sides, right? So you have the entrepreneurial side, you're, you're a risk taker, but also you have the academic side. So can you speak to both of those sides and how do you know if you go down this road or you go down that road? especially as a kid nowadays, because, you know, my daughter, my daughter said to me the other day, she's like, dad, I'm in seventh grade. And, you know, uh, I see other people going to college, I see my cousins, you know, thinking about college, they're, they're doing this, they're doing that. I don't have a thing Dad. that's what she said to me the other day mm -hmm. to my, like my seventh grader, like, and, and you've seen both sides of it, right? What advice do you have to, to a, a kid who's going through it and kind of doesn't know their path? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a luxury to know your path early on, right? I mean, very few kids, I think, know what they're doing. My, my kids don't know what they're going to do. So, like, I, I don't um, – and I don't think I knew what I was going to do until I was, like, 30 or 40 years old, right? I mean, it's it's a luxury. The kids who, I think, you know, are blessed to know that they're going to be um, a genetic researcher or something at the age of three because they were looking at plants outside, like, that's a blessing, and I think that's unusual. So I think most people have to spend the time to figure it out. And for me, it's just, yeah, there's a, there, the risk taking is such that you want to take risks because you want to learn, right? That's the mentality that I have is um, you, you want to create an environment, especially for kids that they can take these risks that they can learn. Now, you, you obviously have to put some guardrails because you don't want kids um, literally getting hurt over things. Uh, but as long as the guardrails are there, you want to give them as much room to take risks and fail and, and learn from, because it's not, it's not failure, right? It's just tuition. It's just tuition. You're just learning something. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I, I, I encourage my kids to try a bunch of different things. Um, and I think it's perfectly fine that if they don't know what they're going to be destined to do, because you have your whole life to kind of figure that out. What keeps you going when you don't have to? Well, I'm a, um, in my business, I'm, I have to be, not have to be, I am a techno optimist. In other words, I think there are a lot of problems that I see out there that need solving. And, um, and I think that technology plays a big role in solving those problems. And there are a lot of people, really impressive people that I'm um, lucky to be around that are amazing researchers that I think will really push the future forward that can solve a lot of these problems. It's not the technology is not the only solution, but I do, but it's the only, it's the one that I know that yeah. um, I'm most familiar with. So that's the one I lean into. And if I can play a small role in helping um, some of these technologists and entrepreneurs usher in that future, I think um, it'll help because we got some serious problems coming up, right? like some <laughs> serious problems coming up. And I think, um, I think, you know, I think technology will solve it. So, I mean, I'll give you like, I, like there's a, um, there's a lot of problems that I care about because we have kids, right? Like uh -huh. climate change and, um, and, you know, gun reform, gun law reform, right. Or, um, you know, transportation, these types of things. And I think, you know, our planet's problems or, um, the country's problems can, uh, in some extent, I think I want to take a technology centric approach to it. Right? Like, what could you do if somebody invented what you see on Star Trek or Star Wars? Um, could you, you know, could you change the future for the better? And that's the approach. That, that's what keeps me going. So what is the, what's the, the craziest idea that you have now 
that you know is going to be normal. Like if I would have told us in high school, you're going to have this device in your, in your pocket that's basically going to be more powerful than all the school computers that we have on our whole entire campus, and you're going to be able to have all these things. You're going to be able to call up some random dude to show up and give you a ride to the airport, and you won't even have to give him any money. If I would have told you that when you were in high school, you would have been like, that's nuts. What are some of those things right now that you're dealing with that are not going to be so crazy in five, 10 years? Yeah. Well, I think, I think that car that comes pick you up probably gonna be a flying car pretty soon. Right. So, How soon so, do you think Eric? Well, I think, um, I think, uh, it, it, it is a function of regulation, right? I think, but I think maybe a decade to 15 years for flying cars and probably five to 10 in, within five years, you're already seeing the, um, robot taxis work. So, I think robot taxis in about five years and then um, autonomous flying taxis in 10 to 15. That would be my guess. For you? I had that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you. I was, I, I was, tell, talk, I was telling, I, I remember telling my daughter who's 14 now that she would never have to drive. <laughs> this, is, this was a like seven years ago or so, five years ago when the AV uh, autonomous driving vehicles were just getting started. And, you know, what I've learned is that those things are, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm off by a few years cause she, she is going to have to learn to drive, but, um, but it will happen, right? Like, I think a lot of what I have realized now is that most of the ideas that I come across, it's just a question of when it will happen. Most of them are good ideas, right? Like we even saw this in 99 and 2000, the first dot com boom where a lot of those ideas um none of the, a lot of them didn't work out they crashed and burned like pets.com or um web van but those ideas 20 years later are great ideas you have instacart now that is basically web van and you have you know a bunch of you know on-demand pet delivery <laughs> pet food delivery companies so it's just sometimes we just have to um we don't want to be too early yeah sometimes those ideas just need time but i'm like an optimist like those ideas are going to happen sometimes how do you know when, for you now, how do you know when to not be early? Um, <laughs> because, it, yeah. you know, that, that, that's probably, I mean, that, that's probably the, the trillion dollar question, I guess you would say. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, a lot of that comes down to reading the tea leaves in our business or looking at markets and really talking to early adopter customers. Right. So, you know, even with self-driving cars, there's, um, you know, people are doing it already, but just in pockets. So there's a saying where, you know, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed, which means that there are people doing stuff in the future. So if you just squint hard enough, you can see, you know, some, somebody doing some crazy stuff that will be widely adopted in the future, which feels like the future, right? But it's already happening now. It's just, there's a few people. Uh, I'll give you an example in the healthcare space. And uh, there's a ton of activity around long, longevity research. So not treating diseases like diabetes or cancer, but actually getting to the root cause at the cellular level uh, in your genetics. So you can actually, um, you know, turn back the clock, so to speak, and regrow your eyeball if you need to. Like if you're if you lose your vision, you can actually go back and regrow your eyeball and trigger the genes to do that. And that's being done in mouse models right now. So um, they have effectively turned, um, given vision back to a blind mouse and literally regrown the optic nerves. Um, and I think that stuff is in trial. So it's super early, but you know, in, in 20 years from now, because it's healthcare, it's, it's, there's more regulations, more safety testing, you will see a lot of these issues addressed. Um, and I'm, so I'm super, uh, there's a ton of people working on this stuff. Um, and so I'm super optimistic about it. So you talk, you, you use the name Elon Musk a couple of times, and it was interesting to me when I read his book that the whole reason why he did what he did was just to populate Mars. I thought at first it was like he wanted to make the electric car. He wanted to do all this stuff. And he was like, no, I think that's the next frontier. I want to populate Mars. So I'm going to do SpaceX. I'm going to do Solar City. I'm going to do paper. I'm going to do all these things that's going to help to be able to get that. What is that populating Mars for, for Eric? Like, what's the thing that is most burning inside you that if, if you got a chance and your whole life, you only got to solve one more challenge, 
what would that challenge be on this earth? Oh, that's, that's a good question. I don't think I have an overriding um, ambition like that. I think uh, it may sound a little cliche, but I do want to give the opportunity for a lot of different founders to start companies. Because I do think like, you know, how are we going to, like my, my, uh, this is kind of what I've been trained to think of the world from a venture capital perspective, which is allocating a bunch of small bets and enabling people to pursue their um, vision so that they can solve major problems. And I want to be able to increase the number of people that have those ambitions. So in other words, like find the Elon, the next Elon Musk, right? The next Elon Musk may not have gone to um, school at Wharton or um, been in the PhD program at Stanford. So, you know, the next Elon Musk might be some kid in, you know, some Polynesian island somewhere with an internet connection or in Southeast Asia in a village. Um, and I think it sounds a bit cliche, but I, I want to do what I do, but eventually open it up to other people. Cause we're very, you know, I'm, I've been, you know, we've invested into um, over a hundred companies and most of them are in the Bay area. Most of them look like me, like they're, um, you know, they're Stanford grads and, you know, they come from um, academic backgrounds, that kind of thing. But everybody has uh, around the world has ideas, but not necessarily access to resources. So if you fl- if we flip the paradigm, right, and we flip the paradigm and and made you a, a, an idea and a startup guy, mm-hmm. knowing what you know now in venture capital, what would be the three things that you put in line that would be your foundation that you knew you were going to get funded? You mean like from an abstract perspective or just well, uh, from, from your, like if we flipped it around and we said, now you're not a uh, venture capitalist anymore, you are a, uh, an idea visionary okay. and you're a startup. What are the yeah. three foundations you would build your, your idea and your startup on that, that way, when you walked in to see you, then yeah. you know, you're walking out with the deal. Yeah. So it's, so it's funny. Like the, the standard answer is you want um, a strong team. You want, um, a big market opportunity and some tech, right? Some product around it. But for me, what I would do is if I had three um, silver bullets, I would spend them all on a really good engineer, another really good engineer, and a third good engineer. Because <laughs> it really is people that drive the early stages. So so like, I, I can't tell you the number, we, like of all of our companies, even the ones that have been successful, they never do what they set out to do. They always change and they have to, right? Because markets change. Um, the tech world is very dynamic and um, it doesn't matter how good your product is. It's really the people and the team that you can bring along with it because the team is, you're basically investing in the team at the early stages. And so for me, it's come, it comes back to this thing about people. It's taken me forever to learn this lesson, right? Because you get infatuated with cool tech or big markets, but it always comes back to the people. Wow. Well, it's, it's funny that you say it because we started off talking about my pop and my pop would always say to us, I don't know if he ever said this to you, but he would always say that there's one business in the world and one business only, and that's the people business. You take the people out of the business, you have no business at all. Um, that's true. It's, and it, it's true. incredible, but it's incredible to hear it from your standpoint. So like say in a founder, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you have the canned answers, right? Of like, what do you look for in a, in a founder? And then people are like, oh, well, I look for a leader. I look for... What are those things that when a person walks in the room, what are some of the, like, what are some of the intrinsic things you're looking at and being like, you know, this could be a winner? Yeah, there's a couple of heuristics that I look for. Most of it has to do with um, the ability of the founder to recruit other people like him or her. So um, a good heuristic that I use is like, you know, would would my 30-year-old self want to work for this person? Because I think, I mean, if you think about it, right, like the, we always have this, um, this, this hypothesis that the first 10 employees of a business kind of make or break the business because they, they hire their friends and then they set the culture of the company going forward. So like the first 10 engineers at Google, the first 10 at Facebook, the first 10 at Palantir, like those are the foundation of the building. And so if you're a founder, how can you recruit like those first 10 people are just as good as the founder. They have to be like the LeBron James as well. But LeBron James is going to want his own company, right? He's going to want to run his own team, like Kyrie, right? Like he's going to he's going to want to leave and, and be the star on his own team. 
So how many people can go and say, you come work for me, you work on my dream and sacrifice your dream and let's go do this together. So very few people can do that. And so that's, that's the storytelling, the, the, the charisma recruiting piece of it that I think is so important for founders that we look for. That's the heuristic is like, do I think he or she can recruit 10 other people just like that, just as good as them? How do you, I mean, like, I want to switch back to your family, right? Because again, when you have hard charging, I, I watch this all the time. Like, you know, when you have hard charging um, people who are at, at, when I say it, like uh, the friends that I get a chance to be able to hang out with, and I'm very, I've been very fortunate in my life to be able to do this. A lot of times you see hard charging people, you see their home life explode. Right. And, but they're really, 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 really great at what they do. There's very few times where you find a unicorn like yourself that's wildly successful in your family and wildly successful in your, in your endeavors. How, how do you continue to stay in that, in that place? And, and how important is your, is the success with your family? Uh, you know, and how is it linked to your success in your business? Yeah, I, I think you have to work at all of those parts of your life that are important. You have to spend time on them. You have to, cause yeah, you look at, I mean, um, you know, like marriage is not easy, right? Like you look at the divorce rates and the odds are stacked against you, right? Like everybody says it's not going to happen to you, but you really have to spend time on that stuff. And I think it's something that I have to work on. Right. I think, um, and I, I, and I'm blessed because I think, you know, Laura has had a better career <laughs> than I have. And like most, most of the founders that, you know, come talk to me, want to talk to her, right? Cause she, you know, she built an incredible business and she took it really all the way. And so I think those types of things, like, so, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, this is a very, we're very blessed because we both have um, careers that we're pursuing at different times. And, you know, like she's not as active now, but, you know, um, I was a little, I was more involved with the kids earlier on when she was like in the middle of um, building a company. So I, I just think like, you know, it's, it's, uh, you have to work at it all the time, right? You can't just let it to chance. So I think for me, I mean, I think, um, I don't take that stuff for granted. I'm very paranoid <laughs> about making sure your family, uh, my family stuff is, is working. Um, and it's at the same time, it's a very competitive business. So you just have to carve out time for that stuff, you know? Um, and again, it can't be like, I've tried to, you know, do, I think we, we were kind of like you, right? The one, two, three thing. Like I tried to process, make, put a process in place. <laughs> like, you know, we try and spend 15 minutes talking. We go for walks every night. Um, but you, you just have to make time, right? You just have to be there. I don't know. That's kind of a non-answer, but. No, it's a, it's a great answer, man. It's a great answer. So how do you, like, who inspires you, man? These days, I think it's, you know, I do a lot of things because of Laura. Yeah. You know, I want to, I want to do things because I want to make her proud. Like I want her to, um, and then for my kids, right? Like my kids are now at an age, like, like your daughter where they they're like many adults now so you kind of want to do things to make them proud of you right like that that is sort of what's driving you know i don't, I don't want to be a bum right <laughs> so, so and have my kids like learn the wrong lessons so I, I i want them to observe at least um you know kind of me doing interesting things with my life mm -hmm. so i think a lot of it is that and then i think a lot of it is just in, intrinsic in my um because I'm, I'm optimistic about the future and what I see a lot of our founders around me are doing and building. And that just kind of keeps me going. So how can you foster optimism? Like how, how can you build that muscle? Cause I, I believe it's a muscle. My dad was very optimistic. Um, you know, and I don't know if you know this, but you know that Rob and I had to sleep teach, you know what that is? You know, I, um, I heard you talk about it in a previous podcast. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, it was some crazy stuff. You know? That's crazy. I didn't know that. You, no, I didn't know you guys did that until you talked about it in a previous podcast. So what is that? Like you guys would actually write down in a, in a journal and listen to stuff when you well, guys are sleeping? When you and Rob met, you were in sixth grade. So from sixth grade to eighth grade, Rob had to, Rob and myself, we had a, a, a auto reverse Walkman with a headphone. My dad broke the headphones. So one in each, strung it through our wall, put it in our pillow and we had to sleep for eight to 10 hours a night with uh, 
uh, self or personal development tapes running in our no. pillow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Man, your dad is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. How can you build optimism then? Like, is the, I mean, is it, were you, was it born in, was it born in the Chin family? Um, or is it something that you can develop? No, I think you got to just be curious about the world, right? Like, I think you just have to be curious and interested in learning things. And um, cause I think there's so many, I mean, there's so much information out there, but like there, you know, that's why I do try and read um, a lot about new things. Um, I try and find the right people to learn from. Um, cause I think, you know, you, there's so many experts out there now and it's the information is so easily available through podcasts and, and all that stuff that the more you get into the details about what is coming, you can't, but help optimistic versus like, if you're just, um, if you're just consuming information as it comes to you sort of passively, then it becomes, you know, it's that signal to noise thing. It's a lot of noise and it's depressing. <laughs> so, so, you know, if you're very intentional about what you want to learn and who you want to meet, um, I think you can't help but be optimistic. It's like your show, right? Like you, you're very intentional about the people that you want to bring on. And I'm sure if you talk to a bunch of people, like the people that you interviewed on your show, you can't help but be optimistic about it. If you learn about their stories and their lives. I mean, freaking uh, Lee, uh, Lee Steinberg was on your show, right? Like, yeah. That's amazing, right? <laughs> so that's cool. I, mean, I just think like that stuff is like, um, you know, it's some bit of storytelling too, right? Like you need these narratives. And you get that, I think, from just digesting a lot of information, talking to, talking to a lot of interesting people. So, Eric, what do you wish that people knew about Eric Chen? And let's do it in compartmentalized, right? So your high school friends, what do you wish they knew? Your Stanford friends, what do you wish they knew? Your Wall Street friends, what do you wish they knew? And now in Eric's life now, what do you wish that people knew more about Eric? So let's start with high school. Oh, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. I mean, I, I wish I would have paid more attention to those relationships from high school for sure. Um, growing up, because I think, um, I really did, you know, I, 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 I kind of not resent, but I kind of, I didn't want to be known as the smart, you know, the guy who got good grades, you know what I mean? Like, so I, I wish that in high school, um, that I would have spent more time. It goes both ways. I would have spent more time trying to get to know people um, a little deeper. And it's the same way, right? I wish they, that other people would try and get to know me a little bit deeper. And I was a little bit, you know, um, sh you know, I had a bit of a, you know, a shield up, right? In kind of the way I was raised and stuff. So it's, and I probably wasn't the easiest person to get to know back then, but, cause I just think like everybody in our friend group is so interesting. Everybody has their own personal story that's very unique. Um, and I wish that I would have dug in there and I wish that would have been, um, reversed as well. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Let's, High go, school let's, yeah. let's go to college. Let's go to college. And, uh, you know, that, that wall street time, what do you wish that those people that you got a chance to be around, what do you wish that they would have known about you, about Eric? Yeah. I mean, I think at that point I was so focused on execution that, you know, maybe that, um, that I was curious, right? Like I wanted people to, to help, uh, teach me stuff, right? Cause I, at that point, when you're young, I was very sort of into projecting strength, you know, because you're a young kid and, you know, you haven't done anything in your life and, um, you, you know, you, you're supposed to, you have a Stanford degree, so you're supposed to be doing some awesome things, but everybody has this sort of imposter syndrome that they go through. Like I had that for like 10 years. Right. And I wish that people could just see beyond that and be like, you know, I want to, you know, I want to learn from you. Right. So I wish people would just see that and say, this is, he's just a student. He just wants to learn. Um, and I think some of that is just, you know, there's, we, we do a lot of this stuff where it's like, oh, I got to try to take my job. I'm trying, is he trying to take my position? And so it's a little bit scary if people are, they, they have their guards up and, and I just wanted to really like looking back on it. I just wish that I, I, there's so many people I could have learned from. What about now, like in your community now? Um, because I think a lot of times I, I think what I found is that one of the number one 
desires of every person I come across is to be heard, <laughs> right? Is, is, to listen, is to be listened to and that your story be told um, mm-hmm. and that someone cares about it. Like, what, what do you, like in, your, in your realm now, I think a lot of times people look at you in your realm now and they're like, no, nah, Eric's cool. Like everything's good with Eric. Er- Eric's cool. He doesn't need anything. What do you wish that they knew now? Like in your, in your circles now, what do you wish that they knew or maybe that they asked, uh, you know, or opened up and, and were curious about with you? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, I think it's mostly about this notion of fit for me. In other words, let me try and explain that. It's that, you know, not everything is a good fit for me right now. And I'm not a good fit for every opportunity. So like, it's okay if, you know, like we don't have time for each other or that they don't want to work with me. Um, because it's not a right, it's not a line, uh, it's not necessarily a line. That is uh, what I'm focused on these days, which is, you know, like for there to be a business relationship or even a personal relationship, there's got to be a good, um, there's got to be good chemistry. And sometimes it's just, you know, there's not going to be good chemistry or there isn't good alignment. And I think that's, oh, I want people to know that that's okay, if that makes sense, like that they can say no to me. I'm not going to be, um, I'm not going to be distressed about it. I won't hold them in that, in, you know, negative regards. It's that, that, you know, that I, cause I want everybody to be focused on what I think it is that is right for them. And at the same time, I want to be focused on what's right for me. So that's kind of the stage that I've evolved to, which is really finding um, the meaning, doing the meaningful stuff for me uh-huh. and then helping other people. And I think, you know, I wish other people would do the same as well when, when they're talking to me. Does that, does that make sense? Absolutely. Kind of, yeah. What, what brings Eric like unbridled joy that has no ROI at all? This is going to be a cop out, but I think there's probably two. One is I've been surfing a lot. So like just getting out in the water is. You got game? You got, very, game, out, you got game out in the water? You got it? <laughs> I ha- I'm a, uh, yeah, I mean, Laura's from Hawaii. So I learned to um, surf. <laughs> a bit. But um, it is very um, mental for me in the water, right? Like you, you, uh, you have to be very focused and. Uh, very attuned to the environment around you so they, they can't so you kind of let go right? so that's that's pretty cool that you know that that is something that i do enjoy quite a bit um and then the other thing is just watching my kids do well mm. i think that um and do well in the sense of you know not, not necessarily like scoring a goal or something but just um they struggle and then they get to that next point you know like just watching them grow, I think, is really, it recently has been um, really good to see. Something that we both have in common now is we've, we've lost both of our parents, correct? Yeah. If you got a chance to sit down with Mr. and Mrs. Chen now, and you had 15 minutes, and then they're gone again, what do you say to them? I, I would have thanked them for the opportunity. I didn't realize how hard, I mean, it's, it's kind of true, right? Like, um, certainly when my dad passed, um, I was still young. And then when my mom passed, my kids were young and I didn't really understand like mm. your, my parents until I had kids. Like, you don't, you know, like you just, yeah, now you and I are turning into our parents now, right? So, so now we understand. But like, I think if if I could have that time back, because um, my I still hadn't internalized what it meant to be a parent, um, not until high school really, um, because a lot of the friction that I had with my parents were in high school because I was hanging out with you guys, right? So, <laughs> so it was. Uh, I think I didn't really get that until um, my kids are now in high school. So I'm, now I'm starting to understand this is what it means to be a parent. 
of a teenager. And I would have, I would have said thank you because I think they did a lot of things right. And they, I think they did a lot, a lot of things uh, that put me and my brother in a, in a position where we could succeed. Eric, what, what advantage do you have because your parents were immigrants? Well, the obvious thing, the most tangible one is that they just pounded home the importance of um, getting a good education as your, the tool that you need in your toolbox to get out, right? But I didn't under, I underestimated um, kind of, you know, I think, so that's, that's an immigrant thing for sure. Well, at least from, from our family, that's, to me, I, I tie that back to their sort of upbringing in Taiwan and in China. That it was just really important to do well in math, basically. Right? Like you have to do good, math. you have to be good at math. And and uh, but I also, um, you know, I think the American immigrant experience is such that you want your kids to fit in. Like you want, um, it's a trade off, right? Because I remember um, thinking, like, why do I have to do all this crazy Chinese stuff, right? Like it doesn't help me here in Lompoc, right? <laughs> like it just, I'm never going to use this Lompoc. Why am I learning Mandarin? And I think um, the, the more I realize, and the, the older I get, I realize that like, it really is what my mom used to say, which is you want to take the best of both. Like you want to try and combine the best of um, two cultures because you're privileged. You're in a position where you have two different cultural influences and you can pick and choose, you know, some good things, some bad things, and uh, you can optimize for it. So that's what I mean by like, I think they, they put us in a position to succeed and they give us, they gave us a lot of optionality to do what we wanted to do. So, and I think that's a uniquely immigrant experience to some extent. Mm -hmm. well, well, we put you not on a pedestal in a bad way, but I, I'm telling you just, just in our family, um, with myself, my brother, my whole family, we've we've always been so inspired by you. Um, we're both, I believe, you and I are both inspired by a, a similar person, which is my brother, and oh. um, he's al he's always been my hero. Um, literally, like the dude could just call me and just be like, "I'm proud of you," and then just hang up, and I'll be like, I "I'll run through a wall," you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like I can accomplish anything. I, I remember he got me a, a book. It was a Dr. Seuss book. It was um, the places you will go. And I remember like he got me that for Christmas and I read it as if he was reading it to me and telling me that I could do anything and I would go. What message do you have for Rob, Eric? Yeah, Rob Robinson realized that he was a big influence for me. Like there are some things I do today that are riffing off of jokes that he told, like those stupid jokes that he used to tell, right? Like way back in the day. And I'm just... Like, where did that come from? It came from Rob, right? Like, like you know, his stupid pickup jokes or his, you know, like not his, you know, his stupid puns. Like, I still use those things right? <laughs> to break the ice or whatnot. And so I, I think it's amazing, like, what you take away from your, um, that, that part of your life, right, that sticks with you. So for me, a lot of it was just hanging out with him. And, like, for, for Rob, it was sort of he had this unique ability to know people, to really understand people of all types right now um, and he was always sort of the you know he was the guy in our crew right we just you know you, there's always a guy at every school and he was the guy like that that uh that everybody looked up to and did things the quarterback the team and all that stuff but he also had this ability to know everybody right like just everybody and i think that as i've gone especially in the business i'm in now where i'm you know dealing with people all the time that's the stuff that's important and it started with rob right like it was just yeah, it's it's weird, but I, I will still remember things, um, and they come up and I don't remember the exact context, but I'll remember a snippet of what he said, and it'll pop up in a random conversation, and I'll crack a joke, and I think I think that I think that's something I got from Rob. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I tell you, Eric, it uh, you know I, I started the podcast because of my kids, right? Uh, Matt, Maddox is ten, uh, McKenna's thirteen, so Maddox is the uh, he just won his uh, FNL. Um, championship uh in fourth and fifth grade or third and fourth grade so he just won that so i want to give a shout out to him um but he's a superhero like he he literally plays the game wins the championship and then we're like what'd you feel about the game he's like ah, what's for dinner he doesn't really care he just goes out he's so natural at things he's amazing um and he's walks to, or walks to, or you know marches to the beat of his own drum completely um my daughter's an artist 
um, got a huge heart. She's, uh, she wants to get into the acting realm, the, uh, the writing, producing, all those things. But I started the podcast for them because I want to take iconic people like yourself, and I wanted to show them that the Eric Chins of the world aren't superheroes, that they're people who have phenomenal attitudes with great work ethic. So what advice would you have for Maddox and McKenna, Eric? And if you could use their names, it would be amazing. So I'd say um, Maddox, you never lose, right? You either win or you're learning, but you never lose. <laughs> That's uh, I love that quote. Um, McKenna, I'd say, um, yeah, I mean, you, there's a purpose, there's a, there's a purpose, uh, for you, right? You just have to find it. Like there's a reason why you do what you do and you just have to go and find it. Um, and it's okay to try different things, but eventually you'll get there. Well, Eric, you have been, uh, honestly, it is, it has been my absolute honor uh, to be able to have you on the show. And, and I'd love to, I'd love to be able to have you on more. This is how I ask in front of people. It's like when we were growing up and you want to stay the night at your friend's house, you asked in front of the other parents. So then they had to say yes. Um, so I, I, I really, I would love to, to have you on the show again. Um, and, and multiple times just because of just the, the man that you are, the individual, the human being that you are in so many different aspects from a, a husband, a father, a friend, um, and a human being. And I just, I, my, my hat's off to you, man. And I just want you to know how much impact and how much light you bring into this world, even when we don't get a chance to talk, because I think it's been probably 10 years, um, 10 years since I saw you. And it was a, almost kind of a flyby, but I want you to know that you have an impact on me every single day of my life. And I want to thank you for that, man. Thanks, Kelly. It's, it's good to reflect, to see, like, I don't really get a chance to think about how Lompoc and hanging out with you guys influenced what I'm doing today. So it's really made, you really made me think about like, where do I get some of these things from? And it, it comes, it goes all the way back to Cabrillo. <laughs> it's just amazing, right? Like some of the stuff comes all the way back. So I, I, I think I don't ever have a chance to think about it that way. So I, I really appreciate you um, asking me to be on. I'd be happy to come back. Um, really enjoy catching up. Well, I appreciate you, man. And uh, now's the time if you're out there listening. Um, I, on the, you see the little blue book uh, uh, on top of us. It's an audio book. Um, it's the most non-traditional uh, audio book that you'll ever read or listen to. Um, check out the sponsors. Do the things that you know you need to do. Um, but make sure that you share this episode with every single person. And I think the message that I want to send to every person out there is... The friends, especially, I mean, if you're a young person, you're listening to this, you're in the seventh, eighth grade, whatever it is, realize that those relationships that you're making right now will impact your life for years and years and years to come, and they will be your foundation. And people freaked out all the time when I tell them that my best friends today are still my best friends from fourth grade. But the relationships that you make, the people that you come in contact are the most important thing that will ever happen. So uh, again, Eric, you're an amazing man. And uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank your family for letting me steal the time. And, <laughs> um, and also, too, just want to let you know that you're officially off the hot seat. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Appreciate it.